That's a table saw kickback. Pretty scary, right? Well, it certainly is the nightmare of every single woodworker and certainly not good news if you're cardboard Danny DeVito. We wanted to take a look at what happens during a kickback, calculate the force it's traveling at, and talk about the causes of kickback, how we can prevent it, and how to protect yourself if it does happen to you. So we rented the brand new Phantom TMX 7510, which is capable of an amazing 70,000 frames per second in high definition. We did about 30-ish kickbacks using this jig that I created uh, that allowed us to safely create a bunch of kickbacks. And we even got a ballistics gel dummy to test what would happen if it hit the human body. So let's get started by taking a look at one of these slow motion clips. Now this is at 50,000 frames per second. And you can see here that it doesn't feel like anything's happening, but this board is slowly turning towards the back of the blade. And that's when the teeth start to grab in an unnatural way and start to grab it almost like hooks. And we'll see here in a minute from another angle uh, how it's grabbing it. But as it goes into orbit here, you can see it looks like an absolute explosion. Look at all that sawdust and violence that's going on in that shot. In fact, if we rewind it, you can see that it shakes the rip fence. Now this is a rip fence on one of the nicest table saws on the market. It's designed to be rock solid when you push giant pieces of lumber through it as you rip boards and long rip cuts. And now when we look at it from another angle, you can really start to see the forces at play here. This shot actually really hurt my hand because as it pinched it between the blade and the stick I was using to push it forward, uh, my hand was on the other side of that board holding a handle. And the impact gave me kind of a bruise on my palm and definitely shocked me, scared me a little bit. More importantly, you get a much better look at how this happens. The board is turning towards the blade and as it grabs it, it goes over the top of the blade, which is like a slingshot. And this isn't the only way that this happens. It can happen several other ways. Cross-cutting against the fence, that's a big no-no. And that means boards that are wider than they are long, you would never use your fence for that cut. Pinching. Sometimes when you leave wood from the curf of the cut, the forces will pinch that board into the blade. Freehand cuts, you never cut freehand on a table saw. That is a big no-no. Crooked or twisted boards can cause kickbacks as well. There's a lot of up and down movement when you get through your cut and it releases the other piece of wood. It could twist into the blade. Poor saw maintenance. You want to make sure, I have a great video, I'll link it up here in the top right hand corner of your screen, about how to tune up your table saw. It's really important that your fence or your blade is not uh, wider at the opening of your cut and then narrower at the end. It can happen when you're doing thin rips. When your blade is very, very near your rip fence, it can cause it to shoot straight back at you because there's just no space for the wood to go in between your blade and your fence. Obviously, there's the riving knife, but we'll talk about that more when we talk about prevention. Here, as we look head on, this is how we're gonna judge velocity, acceleration, and force. As you can see here, there is so much power and force that happens in the event of a kickback, but how do we calculate it? So this is the board we use to protect me from the kickbacks. I was back here pushing this handle here. I was also wearing a full face mask. And each one of these vertical lines are two inches apart. So we can calculate because it's moving at 50,000 frames per second. We can calculate distance, time, all of those things, but I know it sounds a little complicated and I'm just uh, your average woodworker who needs a calculator for everything. So I reached out to my friend Jens Falo from the awesome YouTube channel, Flammable Maths. He also has a second channel where he does woodworking. He's doing a series called Math for Woodworkers right now. I'll link both his channels down below. Jens, thanks for helping us smooth brainers out. Uh, can you break down how uh, we found the acceleration and calculated the velocity of this piece of wood? Yeah, sure, Jonathan, that's not a big problem. So if we take a look at the video footage from Jonathan, we can find out a few things which are very necessary to get our calculations done. So on the one hand, we had a distance traveled of 55.8 centimeters on the horizontal line, and also our block of wood basically overcame a height of 21.27 centimeters. You may know from school back then that you can find out what the hypotenuse in the right triangle is by using Pythagoras. Using the formula square root of all the legs squared added together, you are going to get a diagonal line or the hypotenuse, which is being the distance traveled of our block in the video footage of 0.6 meters approximately. Now, next up, we want to calculate what the acceleration is. This is very important to also calculate the force later on. Now, in a normal case, if we assume the acceleration to be at a constant rate, just for simplification purposes, we know that the acceleration is nothing other than the change in velocity over time. Now we don't know exactly what the velocity here is, but what we can do is make use of the fact that our distance that, that we travel in a certain amount of time is going to grow parabolic. 
Doing some physics and some mathematics, plugging all the things into the formula is going to arrive us at a final formula for the acceleration as being two times the distance traveled divided by the time squared. Now we know all of these things. The time is something that Jonathan can calculate from his footage and the FPS that he gathered. Also we know what our travel distance is, 0.6 meters, meaning if we plug all of this into a calculator and play engineer, we are going to get 979 meters per second squared as our acceleration. Holy murder, man. So that's fast, but that's not the whole picture, right? We weighed these boards. In fact, this one from the shot that we're looking at weighed one pound, 7.3 ounces or 660.5 grams. Now, how would we go about calculating the force? That's a very good question, Jonathan, and it's actually pretty easy to calculate by using Newton's second axiom of motion. If you don't know what it is, he discovered it by getting hit by an apple. And what he noticed is, that we can calculate ourselves the force by taking the acceleration that our object has, so the thing that we just calculated, multiplied by the mass of the object. The heavier something is, the more it's going to hit you in the face. Now, we know what the mass of our object is. It's 0.66 kilograms and we know what the acceleration is. We just now calculated it. Plugging this into a calculator and playing engineer once again, we are going to get a force of 646.53 newtons out. And by dividing everything by 10, this roughly translates to 64 kilograms hitting you in the face. So that's like uh, half a Jonathan Katzmosis jumping from a 10-story building and hitting you at a very high velocity. That's a lot of damage, I would say. In all fairness, that's a little bit more than half of a JKM. But according to Google, that's a little bit more than half the force of a 9 millimeter bullet, which is really terrifying. Yeah, um, that's quite a lot of force actually, but you can't really compare it to a bullet because a bullet has a way smaller area, meaning it's going to penetrate you way more due to the pressure building up on your skin. But even though it's not a bullet, it's acting like a bullet in some kind of way and it's going to deal a lot of internal damage to your organs and also you're going to get a bunch of broken bones probably out on the other side. Well, thank you so much, Jens. It's certainly sobering to think about it in such a tangible way. If you want to learn more math for woodworkers, I'll link Jens' channel down below. Now, here's the good news about kickbacks. They're very preventable. So let's talk about how to prevent kickbacks and how to protect yourself should you have an unfortunate kickback. Number one, first and foremost, is to use a riving knife, splitter, and or a guard. Riving knives are a piece of steel on modern table saws that ride right behind the blade. It's a little bit thinner than your blade and keeps the board from either turning into the blade or pinching it. Splitters are very much the same, but typically you would use them on an older table saw before riving knives were invented and it would attach to your throat plate. Guards are very much like a riving knife. They have something that goes down the middle that rides right behind the blade, but they also have these anti-kickback devices on both sides that will grab a board if it's shot back towards you. Also, of course, the top, which usually has dust collection in it, keeps the board from being thrown up towards your face or chest. Second, you always wanna use a push stick on a table saw. There's never a reason not to do it. And you wanna make sure that you're not using these bird's mouth only pieces that come with your table saw. Because they don't have a lot of top support, your board can still lift up, which is where things get dangerous. Instead, you wanna use something that has a long portion that keeps the top of the board down. And you can use a second push stick to push it against your rip fence as you're going. You also wanna check the heel of your push stick. A lot of times these get chewed up because you pass it through on thin cuts and it could potentially break while you're pushing a board through, leaving it unsupported. So make sure you're using a push stick with a nice hefty heel on it. Lastly, a feather board. This is one that rides in the miter slot. This is one that has magnets on it so it could stick anywhere on your table saw. These become important, especially the closer the outside of your board gets to the blade or the thinner your cut gets because you want to make sure that your hands are as far away as possible. And this is like a second hand pushing your board into the fence. You also don't want to put your feather board past the front of your blade because then it can push your off cut into the blade creating another kind of kickback situation. So that's how you prevent them. But let's talk about how to protect yourself in case it does happen. Well, here's a shot of our ballistics gel dummy. Uh, and you can see it hits him sort of close to the armpit in the upper pec. And you can see it cuts right into the ballistics gel. Now it wasn't like a four inch incision, but it certainly broke the skin. Here's another angle of a kickback. And this one hits him right in the chest. And we found that actually predominantly kickbacks happen from like above your belly button to your head area. And of course there were some outliers, but this ballistics gel dummy, which was 62 pounds, we set at my exact same height. 
So it's gonna really benefit you not to stand in the line of fire right behind your blade. In fact, at all times when I'm cutting, I'm always standing off to the side. I'm either using a feather board or a push stick to push it into the fence, and I'm pushing through with a push stick. Now, you also wanna make sure your blade is less than one tooth higher than your wood. You never wanna leave a blade fully extended. That can possibly cause kickback. And you wanna protect yourself with PPE. Now, this includes the obvious thing, which is safety glasses like these, but it also matters what clothes you wear. So you obviously don't wanna be wearing nothing like our ballistics gel dummy, and you certainly wanna be wearing maybe something thicker, like a long sleeve shirt, or I guess a jacket if it's cold out. Here you can see we put our 20 ounce wax canvas apron, the same one I'm wearing in this video, on our ballistics gel dummy. This was actually a really interesting kickback because it kicked back twice. It hit him in the chest as if you were leaning over the blade, cutting a piece of wood, bounced back into the blade and then hit him in the chest again. You can see both times we're almost in the same place in the upper torso and you can actually see the marks on the apron. But when we took the apron off, there was little to no damage. It certainly didn't penetrate the skin and really proves that aprons are PPE. Now, no matter which brand you pick, make sure it's a thick canvas or leather and make sure it's of high quality because uh, it's gonna protect you in the long run and certainly in the rare event that you have a kickback. I think every woodworker has one story where they had a kickback and then they, they never wanna do that again so they did everything in their power to prevent it. But I think you really wanna be protected. So I will link that apron down below along with Yen's channel and everything else we talked about in this video. In fact, we just started carrying CMT blades which are my favorite blades and I'll leave a discount code for those down in the pin comment as well. Guys, thanks for watching. Enjoy Danny getting his head torn off in slow motion. Uh, and if you want to support the channel, head over to that Cat's Moses tool store and uh, check out everything we have to offer. Guys, thanks for watching. Stay safe in the shop. Have a wonderful day.